I'm Larry Walther. This is PrinciplesOfAccounting.com, Chapter 8. We're going to continue in this module looking at inventory costing methods. We'll look at an actual example now of calculations related to FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. In this example, Gonzalez Chemical Company had a beginning inventory balance that consisted of 4,000 units with a unit cost of $12 each. Uh, during the period, we had a number of purchases and, and sales. A physical count of inventory confirmed that 5,000 units were actually on hand at the end of the period. And let's look at our schedule of purchases here. So on January 1, we started with the 4,000 units. We bought 6,000 units at $16 each on March 5th. We sold 7,000 units with a selling price, not the cost, but the selling price of $22 per unit. September 7th, we bought 8,000 units at $17. And November 11th, we sold 6,000 units at a selling price of $25 each. So we started with 4,000 units, then we increased to 10,000, then we dropped down to 3,000, and then we had a purchase that brought us back to 11,000 and a sale that took us down finally to 5,000. Now, no matter what costing method we use, FIFO, LIFO, or weighted average, we're going to find that our sales, our total sales, are $304,000. That is, we sold 7,000 units at $22 and 6,000 units at $25 each, giving us total sales of $304,000. Sales are reported in the income statement. Cost of goods sold and gross profit amounts are going to depend on the cost flow assumption used by the company. Looking first at FIFO, here we have calculations, and what we see is we had beginning inventory, $48,000. That's 4,000 units at $12 each. We had purchases that totaled 232,000. That is 6,000 times 16 plus 8,000 times 17. Cumulatively, that's 280,000 of cost of goods available for sale consisting of these layers. Our ending inventory, when we make our allocation of the $280,000, when we allocate that between ending inventory and cost of goods sold, we find $85,000 in ending inventory and $195,000 in cost of goods sold. First in, first out. The first layer, $4,000 at $12,000, is assumed to be sold. Of the, of the next layer, $6,000. That 6000 is all assumed to be sold, having a unit cost of $16. And of our last layer of purchases, $8,000, 5000 of that is our ending inventory. Remember, by physical count, we determined we had 5,000 units. The other 3000 at $17 a unit is assigned to cost of goods sold. So we sold four, six, and three at 12, 16, and 17 respectively. We're left with 5,000 that had a unit cost of $17 to come up with our ending inventory values. And on the financial statements then, our ending inventory, 85,000 appears on the balance sheet. Our cost of goods sold of 195,000 appears on the income statement. Here I've gone to the extra trouble of showing beginning inventory, 48,000 plus purchases 232 to give us our cost of goods available for sale 280 minus our ending inventory that we determined with our calculations under FIFO at 85,000 to give us the 195,000 cost of goods sold. The sales 304 minus the 195 gives me the 109,000 gross profit under FIFO. But let's see what happens under LIFO. We've got the same beginning inventory, the same purchases, the same goods available for sale. The difference here is that we're going to assign 64,000 to ending inventory and 216,000 to cost of goods sold. The ending inventory, last in, first out, the last 8,000 purchases assigned to cost of goods sold, the 5,000 before that is assigned to cost of goods sold, uh, the 5,000 that are ending or an ending inventory is the 1,000 at 16 and the 4,000 at 12. So it totals to a much lower ending inventory number. It's the older, cheaper cost. Here we had increasing cost. The old cheap cost stayed in ending inventory. On the balance sheet, we'll have 64,000 inventory. On the income statement, we'll have 216,000 in cost of goods sold. Again, I know we're going fairly quickly on this video. These, are, these examples, these same examples are in the textbook for you to look at in more detail. The weighted average method takes a little bit different tack. We'll look at our 280,000 of cost of goods available for sale, divided by a total of 18,000 units. That's 4,000 from beginning inventory plus purchases of six and eight respectively, 18,000 units. We get an average cost of 15.5555 cents per unit. I, I ask you here not to round your calculations because oftentimes you're multiplying pennies times millions of units. It adds up to real money, so it's best to carry your decimal out quite a ways when you're doing your weighted average calculations. Our 5,000 units in ending inventory at that per unit price of 15.5555 gives us uh, ending inventory of 77,778 and our cost of goods sold 13,000 times that same per unit price. Again, the, the sum total of these two amounts would equal our 280,000 goods available for sale.
and that appears on the balance sheet as our inventory and the 202222 on the income statement as cost of goods sold. In comparison here, notice uh, what we have. Sales are the same under each of the three methods. Cost of goods sold is different and gross profit is different. There's a generalization here during a period of rising prices, LIFO gives us lower inventories and lower profits. FIFO gives us higher inventories and higher profits. That's logical because the higher, cheaper, more recent costs remain in inventory under FIFO. Weighted average typically falls in between those two as you might expect. Why would anybody consider LIFO? Well, that's probably driven by a, a tax consideration in the United States. Lower profits means a lower tax bill. Be aware that LIFO conformity rules generally say that if you're going to use LIFO for tax, you're also required to use it for accounting. That's a little bit unusual that the tax law is concerned about what you do for financial accounting. Oftentimes they're seen as two different topics entirely. And in many countries, LIFO is not permitted at all. There are some conceptual arguments. LIFO matches recent revenues with recent costs, maybe producing a better matching of revenues and expenses and a better determination of income. However, FIFO places those more recent relevant costs on the balance sheet. The old cheap costs that you might see on a balance sheet using LIFO may or may not signal very much about what the worth could be of the inventory held by the company. Whatever inventory is is used, it must be clearly communicated in the financial statements. Uh, LIFO companies may detail what inventory cost would be if FIFO was used, and uh, whatever method is used, it should be used consistently. Finally, there's a fourth method, specific identification, maybe used for automobiles or furs or jewelry or something like that, where every unit is unique and each unit has a separate cost, and it's worth the trouble to keep up with the cost by serial number, for example, uh, uh, on, a, on a particularly expensive item of inventory. So when that unit is sold, you would find the cost for the specific unit that was sold and make the matching accordingly. It requires tedious record keeping, uh, maybe not such a big deal in this day and time with good computer systems, probably well worth the trouble if you have high dollar inventory. It's typically only used for inventories of uniquely identifiable goods that have a fairly high per unit cost, as I've indicated already, such as automobiles and jewelry. So this concludes our, our look at the calculations under FIFO and LIFO using a periodic system where we waited till the end of the period and then calculated our ending inventory and calculated our, our cost of goods sold and gross profit. In the next module, we will look at these same methods, but considering them under a perpetual and alternative process for managing this data flow.